Hello, and welcome to today's Council on Foreign Relations meeting on American military leadership in the Middle East. I'm Karen DeYoung, Associate Editor and Senior National Security Correspondent at the Washington Post, and I will be your presider today. We have nearly 600 council members registered for today's On the Record meeting, and I think that reflects the interest in what our two distinguished speakers have to say on this very important and very current subject. Retired four-star generals Anthony Zinni and David Petraeus have both served as Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Central Command in charge of U.S. military operations in the Middle East and Central Asia, as well as undertaking high-level missions in and affecting the region since leaving office. I know that members have biographies of both, but I think it's especially pertinent to our discussions today to note that Marine General Zinni served in a number of diplomatic roles, including as Special Diplomatic Envoy under both Republican and Democratic administrations to Israel and the Palestinian Authority and to the Persian Gulf. Bracketing his time as CENTCOM commander, Army General Petraeus served as commander of U.S. and multinational forces in Iraq and in Afghanistan, where he put into practice the Army Field Manual for counterinsurgency operations that he was so instrumental in producing. In 2011, President Obama nominated him as director of the CIA, and he was unanimously approved by the Senate. Today is the 144th day of the Israel-Hamas war. Following the October 7th Hamas attacks from Gaza into southern Israel, where about 1,200 Israelis were killed and more than 250 taken hostage, Israel has conducted a relentless air, ground, and sea attack on Gaza. Israel said its, go its goal is to destroy Hamas and to return all of the hostages. In the process, its attacks have killed nearly 30,000 Gazans, according to local health authorities, most of them civilians. More than 100 hostages remain captive, including six American citizens. Israel has been charged with violating international humanitarian law and support for its efforts have left the United States increasingly isolated on the global stage and in a tough political spot at home. I think there are a lot of questions that arise from that pretty brief synopsis, but I'd like to start just by asking each of you, based on your experience with counterinsurgency in the Middle East and in Israel in particular, to assess the state of the Israeli military campaign so far and what's happening there. General Petraeus, you want to kick us off? Sure, I, I will. And great to see you again, Karen. It's been a little while, but uh, your coverage of this region was always stellar. And it's great to be back with you. And of course, an honor to be with uh, General Zinni uh, as well. Um, first of all, there's an, one additional objective uh, in addition to destroying Hamas and rescuing the hostages, getting them back is also to dismantle the political wing uh, of Hamas and not to allow it to oversee uh, the territory again. I tend to agree with these objectives. I see Hamas as similar to the Islamic State. Yes, it's an imperfect analogy. There's a Palestinian nationalism element to this uh, without question, but I see it that they are irreconcilable. This is an Islamist extremist group, again, that cannot be reconciled by and large. Perhaps some small numbers can, but by and large, this is a group that does need to be destroyed. And keep in mind, the military definition of destruction is not every last one of them. It is to render the enemy incapable of accomplishing his mission without reconstitution. Keep your eye on without reconstitution, because one of the additional areas of focus that I'm going to discuss is the need uh, to prevent reconstitution. And you don't see that yet, uh, in part because the campaign design is actually a bit more of a conventional military campaign, even though it's a war among the people, than it is a counterinsurgency campaign. And as you'll recall from our many briefings together, the three components of counterinsurgency, a civil military campaign, are clear, hold, and build. Um, I also don't want to overlook the fact of how traumatic uh, the loss of 1,200 uh, Israelis and others was if you put that in U.S. terms, that's the equivalent of 42,000 Americans having been killed, keeping in mind that it was not quite 3,000 in the attacks on 9-11. And then the, the hostages would equate to about 7,000. So this is a really, truly 
traumatic event that I don't think people can really appreciate uh, unless you try to put it into terminology uh, associated with our uh, size of population and compare it indeed to to 9-11. The campaign so far, uh, they have largely destroyed Hamas in northern Gaza, um, but we are already seeing efforts to reconstitute there. We're seeing a good degree of success, again, in terms of destroying Hamas in the central part of Gaza, but still relatively early days, despite operations in Khan Yunus uh, in the south, and particularly noting that there's such a huge number of people uh, down there that's been displaced uh, around Rafah in particular, that that is going to be particularly challenging. In fact, uh, you know, the book that I just did with uh, Andrew Roberts, Conflict Since 1945 to Ukraine, uh, we believe that this is the most fiendishly difficult context in that entire period since World War II. Uh, very challenging enemy, doesn't wear a uniform, uses civilians as human shields, has over 350 miles of subterranean, very highly developed uh, tunnel systems and other infrastructure underground, has hostages, uh, and knows the neighborhood, and the dense population is, is very, very significant. So the challenge here is enormous. But the additional components required uh, for a true civil military counterinsurgency campaign include a vision for the people of Gaza, for the Palestinians, that life will be better. This is what we sought to do before we went into Ramadi, Fallujah, Bakuba, Mosul, city of two million people, parts of Baghdad. As you'll recall, we said, we're going to make your lives better. Here's how we're going to do it. We're going to get the enemy out of your midst. We're going to separate the extremists from you. We're going to secure you. Uh, and, and you have to, that whole plan, literally, we would design neighborhoods within a place like Fallujah with entry control points, biometric ID cards, so you can keep Hamas from getting back into the people, uh, causing problems and reconstituting. And of course, restoring basic services, providing humanitarian assistance, keeping uh, loss of innocent civilian life to an absolute minimum. Because of course, if you don't, you're developing the next generation uh, of extremists. And I share the concerns of the president and others who have highlighted the innocent loss, as you just mentioned as well, and the need for additional humanitarian assistance. But it's really about a long-term vision uh, for the Palestinians that they're going to make their lives better, not just take vengeance, uh, of course, uh, on Hamas. And those additional components, we used to have a sign on the walls of the, you know, I had five combat commands as a general officer, and there was a sign staring at me in the face in the operations center that asked a question, will this operation take more bad guys off the street than it creates by its conduct? And you've got to be very, very conscious uh, of that. I think we are seeing signs of much greater recognition of the need for these components, the hold phase in particular, not just clear and move on, but clear and hold. And I hope that we're going to see the build phase commence very soon as well, because you need to get the people back into their homes, secure them, repair all the damage that has been done. And it is obviously very sub substantial. Uh, get the hospitals working again so that you can take care of those that are injured or wounded and so on. And again, a very significant commitment to keeping minimum to a minimum uh, innocent loss of civilian life. So that's how I sort of assess this right now. Again, agree with the objectives, actually, um, but have got to examine the campaign design so that they can achieve the end state, which includes preventing Hamas from reconstituting and also, again, from sowing the seeds of uh, Hamas 2.0. Over. General Zinni? Yes. Well, first of all, I, I certainly agree with General Petraeus regarding Hamas. Uh, in my time there, as I was negotiating uh, with Palestinian Authority, Hamas continued and and kept uh, raising the level of violence uh, until the the talks broke down. And unfortunately, we were very close to an agreement on security. Uh, and Hamas was not interested in 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 peace negotiations or uh, peace agreements, and and obviously was not represented at the table. I think uh, also General Petraeus makes an excellent point about the operation. If we're not, if not being careful, and I think uh, may have already started generating Hamas 2.0, the next generation. Uh, we have a lot of uh, preteen and teenage kids who've watched their families uh, uh, killed or destroyed, their homes destroyed. Uh, and where does that population 
turn. So in, in regards to uh, what comes after this, uh, first of all, we're going to deal with the tremendous humanitarian problem that's going to take a lot to, uh, to fix and to get the uh, Gazans back on their feet in many different ways. Uh, we are in danger of uh, a wider, uh, I think, uh, a regional uh, violent uh, uprising in places like Syria, Yemen, and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, I also think that uh, we have to look at who's going to represent the Palestinians after this. The Palestinian Authority uh, does not have credibility. We just saw uh, elements of their government resign. Uh, they are not trusted. They are not popular amongst the people. Uh, Hamas now, I think, will find a mixed reaction. Some will be so angered that they'll want to, as I said before, create 2.0 Hamas, uh, next generation. Others may resent what Hamas brought them. But somehow, working with our friends in the region, we have got to help the Palestinians reconstruct some sort of representative government that the people accept. And we would be able to deal with going forward in any kind of uh, structuring of a, a, a potential Palestinian state or self-determining uh, entity. Uh, we have to remember, and, and again, going back to General Petraeus, he phrased it differently than I would. I, I'm an old counterinsurgency guy. I taught it in the 60s. And we always said there were three elements. One was environmental improvement. One was uh, obviously fighting the, uh, the insurgent. And, and third was uh, population and resources protection and control. Uh, we saw what happened when the people and the resources weren't protected. Uh, we obviously... Uh, see the fighting going on now to try to use the military as an ultimate solution. I think that's only part of it. Uh, we have to change the environment. Unless the status of the Palestinians is changed, we're going to see this movie again. It's 70 years. And we have to get serious about a mediation effort that resolves the final status issues. And, and again, General Petraeus said this is the most complex situation that you could find. I, uh, I personally felt there were about 10 or 11 final status issues. Each one of them are very, very difficult to address and, uh, and to hopefully look at a solution. I don't think it's going to be left to the United States or to Israel and the Palestinians. We're going to have to involve those in the region. I would love to see the Arab League or some other organization help us with the Palestinian side and join us uh, we've never had that element at the table. Uh, I think we're in danger of, of losing any ground we gain with the Abraham Accords. I think uh, there was warning from especially the UAE that unless the Palestinian issue was addressed, the Abraham Accords will not stick. It was prophetic, you know, in what happened. So I think, uh, you know, we, we have to deal with the long-term future and how we repair this as well as the short-term requirements, both of which are going to be monumental. Thank you. Can I, you know, General Austin uh, went to Tel Aviv shortly after the war started, and we've been told by the Pentagon and by other top officials in the Biden administration that, that the administration has been sharing lessons uh, with Israel about what we learned from close quarter urban warfare counterinsurgency. And I think both of you have talked about what, what some of those lessons are, but I wonder um, if, if the Israelis are actually listening uh, to those lessons. Um, you know, we talk about, about human shields, but here you have, and Hamas, you know, hiding behind civilians, and that's certainly the case. But here you have one of the most, if not the most, densely populated place in the entire world. Um, it's very hard to stand anywhere in Gaza where you're not standing next to or in front of somebody who reasonably could be affiliated with Hamas. And so I, I wonder the way the war is being prosecuted now uh, with this relentless bombing, attacking hospitals, um, really putting pretty strict limits on um, humanitarian assistance. I think that I was reading some of the statistics this morning that uh, even as 
we hear terrible stories about famine and malnutrition and and lack of of medical care. Uh, that that in fact the amount of humanitarian assistance going in now is about half of what it was in January. Um, and so, do you see? Is there a way out of this for for Israel at this point if they continue? How could they alter their current tactics to avoid some of these problems? Whether it's the humanitarian crisis, um, the uh, you know creating new members of Hamas, and when you talk about I'll just shove all these questions in here. When you talk about General Petraeus, the, the need to to give a vision for the future and how you're going to make the Palestinian lives better, um, you know, you, you've got an Israeli government that that basically has said, we are going to continue the occupation. We are going to continue to surround your borders and control your movements. We are going to continue to um, uh, manage security. Um, and so, how, how, again, I, I get to, how do you get out of this unless there's some drastic change that yep. I, I don't see in the cards in terms yep. of, of either side? Yeah. First of all, keep in mind that it took us several years in Iraq to figure out how to do this. You know, Fallujah, we did three times before we actually got it right. Um, Ramadi and others, all of these it took sitting down in back in the United States, um, and I was privileged to largely lead this effort together with Jim Mattis, by the way, we were, we were allies on this effort for our ground forces to distill the lessons that we had learned so far to produce a field manual that actually captured all of those lessons. Um, and this took us experience and time and everything else, and it's a professional force of long uh, service uh, as opposed to essentially the conscript fourth, the IDF is a spectacular organization, but we forget they've never done this before. There's no recent operation remotely like this. They have in the past done forays into Gaza, essentially punitive forays, and then pulled back out. Same in, in southern Lebanon. Um, you'd have to go all the way back to de several decades to the operation into southern Lebanon. And that really wasn't, again, this kind of campaign that I'm describing, which is a comprehensive civil military counterinsurgency campaign with all different uh, aspects of it. Um, not just the military clearing operations to destroy the enemy, uh, but then the hold phase. And the hold phase gets at what you're talking about. It should consist of immediately huge amounts of humanitarian assistance, get people back into their homes, no matter what they're like, rebuild them as quickly as you can, um, restore basic services, get schools, markets, clinics, uh, roads, bridges, all of that repaired as quickly as you can. We would do it as we were going along. But again, it took us several years. It wasn't until 2007 that we actually carried out what I would describe as textbook counterinsurgency operations in an urban setting. And none of them were as challenging as this one is. They were plenty challenging, don't get me wrong, but nothing like what Israel faces. And yet Israel, and we had to change the entire road to deployment. We had to change our all of our courses for commissioned, non-commissioned warrant officers, the original seminar for a unit, the mission rehearsal exercise out in, for, in the Mojave Desert. Um, all of these have to be done. And it took us years to do that. And they're trying to do this on the fly um, without some important components of this, including, again, the explicit uh, commitment that life is going to be better. And here's how we're roughly going to do it, um, roughly. And as you note, again, if there is not that kind of commitment, um, and of course, we know the domestic politics of Israel are particularly challenging um, in the coalition, then it is very difficult to, to develop all the dimensions, all the components of what should be a comprehensive civil military counterinsurgency campaign rather than a conventional military campaign. They're, they are listening. I have had personal experience. They're trying to work through in this setting how to do this. I think there's actually a very significant commitment to reducing civilian uh, casualties, much less use of large munitions in urban areas. But again, let's keep reopen El Shifa Hospital. Let's make it look what right likes looks like and show them the commitment uh, again, to the civilians, that's all th that kind of activity. But again, this sounds really easy. It is fiendishly difficult in this particular setting. Keep in mind the one thing we have not yet seen 
is a lot of suicide bombers, but there's there may well come a point uh, where they face that particular pernicious threat uh, as well. And that changes the, the entire context in which you're operating. So it's, me, this is very, very hard. Let me ask you, General Zinni, you, you've dealt... You had a time of, of not only in the Central Command, but but as a as a diplomatic envoy dealing directly on a day to day basis with with the Israeli government and with the Palestinians. That was during the time of of uh, Ariel Sharon's uh, prime ministership. Not an easy guy to deal with. Um, do you, do you think the Israelis are listening? Do you think that there's room in the way that they've set out their campaign for them to do some of these things now? Um, uh, to to gain some kind of trust from the Palestinian population um, and and particularly looking at what they've said their plans are for the future, which don't necessarily coincide with the Biden administration's plans. Um, is there what what direction do they go in now? And is it possible? I think, you know, first of all, we shouldn't say the Israelis because Right. There are those Israelis that obviously want to see a, a long-term solution, a strategic solution, uh, are agreeable to some sort of self-determination by the Palestinians. There are others that are hardliners that will never agree, uh, and the same on the other side. So you have this mixed bag. Uh, I, I think there has to be uh, all the all the things that uh, General Petraeus mentioned have to be done, obviously, in the short term. Uh, we have to reconstruct a society. We have to build some of the institutions back. But something longer term has to be put in place. I think our approach to trying to mediate toward a longer term solution, let's say a two state solution, whatever that uh, means, has not has not been done in, in, a, in a meaningful way. We've had a lot of well-meaning people, but we do touch and goes on that process. We send out envoys, We, you know, and I was one of them. We send out uh, representatives in the short term. Uh, the, the dialogue breaks down. We go home. Somebody else comes back in the next administration. We needed to establish a long-term uh, multinational, if you will. That's why I mentioned before the Arab League ought to be involved and others. Uh, a mediation process and, and, and a process to bring us to a point where there is some sort of self-determination for the Palestinian people that would convince them to reject Hamas, that would convince them uh, to seek a better alternative than maybe the Palestinian Authority, more representative to, uh, to their needs. Uh, you, can't, you can't, as Dave Petraeus once told me, you can't shoot your way to victory here. Right. All the things right. he mentioned about the military are right on, and it's all the great things that we could do. In the longer term, we need a dedicated commitment with the same kind of commitment that he mentioned that the military provides, not only by our own government, the other agencies of government, but by the international community. Uh, that's the only way you're going to get this done. It'll be a roller coaster ride. There'll be ups and downs. Uh, there'll be violence. But you have to stick to it until you get there. As, as I look at the demographics Roughly the number of Palestinians, both in Israel and, and the Palestinian territories and the number of uh, Israelis, Jewish Israelis, are about the same. Uh, so somewhere along the line, uh, the, the occupation won't work. Uh, the shrinking of the of the area uh, continuously uh, taking more land and uh, pressuring the Palestinians and uh, that won't work. That, that you will we will see explosions like this and as horrific as October 7th uh, was. Uh, so we've got to go, for, we've got to at the same time in parallel with the things General Petraeus mentioned, we've got to give them hope. And you give them hope by some established, enduring, long-term process. Not these little short-term accords and go to Oslo, go to Paris and all this. It's got to be on the ground and it's got to be long-term. I think that the, you know, I think the Arab League is involved in the organization of, of the Islamic Conference. Um, but what they've said is there's not going to be a long-term so solution until the occupation ends and until Israel agrees to a Palestinian state. I mean, that is the long-term policy of the United States. Um, the argument of some of the Arab states, at least I think most of them, is that 
United States, you're the one that has the leverage here. Israel has said it is not going to have either of those things. Is it time for the United States to start using more leverage? Or is that really just untenable when you're dealing with you know, this? You know, the, the, myth, the myth is that the United States can wave a wand and force Israel or force the Palestinians uh, to get to get things done. I don't believe that. I think we are necessary to a process. Uh, I would like to see more involvement uh, by others. I mentioned the Arab League. The Arab League, as you said, is involved, but I'd like to see them involved in the reconstruction of a Palestinian authority that's responsible, responsive to the people, where they would have the greatest influence and the greatest trust. Uh, the United States is not necessarily trusted on either side. I mean, Netanyahu hasn't responded to, you know, maybe he's waiting out the next election, hope it gets better. Uh, it, it, on the Palestinian side, there hasn't been that trust. So, you know, with my time out there, we had the quartet, which made no sense to me. The EU, uh, the, the the Russians and the, uh, the, the uh, UN, uh, we've got to form a better international organization. We could, and that organization could offer incentives for moving the process along. You're going to have to deal with issues like right of return, status of Jerusalem, water rights, uh, all the, the uh, there's about a dozen of them. And some of these may not be resolved in, 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 to the liking of, of either side, but maybe the incentives in building institutions in reparations, and, and they can come from outside, there there could be formulas that are used to resolve some of these issues and put them in place. But no one is collectively, I think, looking at each one of these. Everybody runs off to a short summit somewhere in the world, throws all these issues on the table, and thinks you're going to re resolve them in, in two weeks. It won't work that way. Do you, do you think, General Patera, should the should the United States be willing to use its the leverage, the actual physical, concrete leverage, leverage that it does have in terms of military assistance to Israel? I think it's a really difficult question, Karen. Uh, again, we are committed to their security. Uh, they have sustained a traumatic experience. I tried to lay out just how, put it in context that we would understand. I still don't think we can. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people that have been in. I head out there next week, and as a matter of fact, and I don't think we fully appreciate uh, how extraordinary an event this has been. This is their worst day in history. Um, and so the idea that we're going to lean on them, um, I, I'm, I, I don't see that necessarily. Certainly, there is a lot of conversation. There was use of leverage um, in restricting the sale of certain rifles that were going to end up in the um, settlements in the West Bank. As you may recall, there will be discrete actions like that. There will be a lot of conversations about, again, the tactics, techniques, and procedures of what they're conducting, the campaign design, how to minimize loss of innocent civilian life, and so forth. But I think it unlikely that you're going to see um, you know, the real leverage and I, I, I think General Zinni is right. You know, we sometimes, I think, overestimate the leverage. And especially in a situation like this, where this is a, a life and death matter for them, and the prime minister is in obviously a very challenged uh, political situation as well. Um, and I, again, I just, I find it somewhat unlikely. We're going to take various action, but there's not going to be the kind of real, real stiff uh, exercise of leverage, I don't think. And, and I'm not sure I would agree with it, frankly. Uh, let me add one other concern, though. And that is it really tied to General Zinni's comment, of course, that the Palestinian Authority itself uh, has uh, real challenges when, when it comes to legitimacy, efficiency, integrity, uh, etc. And that creates a huge problem when it comes to who is going to administer Gaza. And I don't see an alternative, actually, in the short term, at least, uh, to Israel having to administer Gaza. Now they can get local partners. There's a variety of ways. You've got to bring back some of the, the elements uh, that used to be, in fact, paid by Hamas, but are not part of the Hamas military wing and weren't in the senior political wing. Um, but there's no government in a box sitting in the West Bank that is trustworthy, competent, and capable on prepared to deploy orders ready to go over into 
Gaza and take over. And that creates another real challenge. So I think inevitably Israel is going to end up owning Gaza, but they have to be really careful about how they do that and the vision that they provide uh, about the temporary nature of this, uh, what the ultimate goal is and so forth. And, but we have not yet seen the commitment to that ultimate goal that General Zenni was highlighting, uh, which is the path out of this, however extraordinarily challenging that is to pursue. Well, of course, the you know the the U.S. plan is that you have a reconstructed Palestinian Authority, and you saw the you saw um, um, President um, Abbas essentially fire his government yes. this week or last week, whenever it was, I think it was this week, um, you know, and there are all kinds of suggestions about technocrats who are going to take over. You Do you think that's going to work, General Zinni? Uh Well, first of all, you have to remember, uh, Gaza threw out the Palestinian Authority and voted in Hamas. Right. Uh, so the pal- return of the Palestinian Authority. After we insisted authority. on elections, of course. Yes. <laughs> Good point. Uh, so uh, any uh, reconstructed Palestinian authority is going to be viewed with the greatest uh, uh, suspicion and have a difficult time. Uh, uh, it has to have representation from within Gaza, uh, definitely. Uh, I would not give it the same title. I, you know, I'm of the belief you probably need to rename and restructure uh, a Palestinian uh, governance uh, institution of some sort uh, from the bottom up uh, involves some of the younger generation. A lot of people are long in the tooth out there that uh, aren't trusted on the ground. Uh, some of this stuff has to be, I think, fairly drastic to, to get the attention of the people and the willingness for them to do the kinds of things you expect in the insurgency, to throw out the uh, uh, you know, the likes of Hamas and other things and 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 have a belief and, and a sense of hope in what you're offering them. Uh, as, as General Petraeus said, it's going to be a long, tough slog, but they have to be able to see some light at the end of that tunnel or some hope that uh, they're going somewhere. Just fixing things or returning them back to what they were or reconstructing you know, hospitals and things like that, which has to be done, don't get me wrong, that will not be enough. You'll go back to the same kinds of, it's the most crowded places on earth, they don't have freedom of travel, lack of opportunity for their young people, uh, an oppressive occupation. Uh, all these things mount up. And, and after all the casualties they've just suffered now, uh, I'm afraid that uh, on both sides, there's going to be a lot of uh, resentment and hate still left in the guts. And if I could just build on that, you know, there's got to be a real commitment to building institutional capacity that can actually do what General Zinni is talking about, and also uh, to the economy, uh, to the infrastructure, to the education system, which needs to be overhauled, uh, to eliminating pay for slay, this incentivization of violence and so forth. Um, and then also a commitment to, to, at the very least, don't create additional obstacles to what presumably would be the rough uh, idea of two states for two people. Let's uh, let's uh, go go to our members um, and invite them to to join the conversation. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. As a reminder, to ask a question, please click on the raise hand icon on your Zoom window. When you are called on, please accept the unmute now button and proceed with your name, affiliation, and question. And as a reminder, uh, today's meeting is on the record. We will take our first question from Aaron David Miller. Please remember to unmute yourself and state your name and affiliation. Hey, yeah, Aaron David Miller, Carnegie Endowment. General Trace, great to see you. Uh, General Zinni, 22 years ago this month, you'll recall. And Karen, it's great to see you. Um, I, I just want to press on, on your, both of your experiences on the military side. There are no rewind buttons on history. And General Petraeus said this was Israel's 9-11. It was in many respects, but, but worse. we didn't have a proximity problem with Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. So the Israelis have a, a different order of magnitude. But I, I'm just curious. if you, I know it's hard to answer this, but was there an alternative, in your view, in the wake of the October 7 terror surge? 
given the political circumstances, the trauma, and the proximity problem? Do do you, do you believe there was a fundamentally different approach the Israelis might have taken in the last five, six months? I'll start quickly and then uh, tag team with General Zinni. But, uh, uh, Aaron, first of all, just uh, congratulations on your latest scholarship, by the way. I've been an avid listener of the podcast of your reflections on the peace process and have you played a role in all of that. Uh, really, truly, I think the, the the best scholar and practitioner uh, on all of this across the, the sweep of time on this. Look, I think that they did have to destroy Hamas. That is the challenge here. And I know there are people that believe that Hamas is reconcilable. I, that's where I just don't, I don't share that with G General Zinni's dealt with. Al-Qaeda in Iraq, later the Islamic State, these are not reconcilable. In Iraq, we actually determined who are reconciled. We had a huge elaborate intelligence process to determine who was reconcilable, and we reconciled with them, 103,000 former Sunni insurgents and, uh, and Shia militia in the surge in Iraq alone. But that did not include the irreconcilable elements, again, of Al-Qaeda in Iraq in particular, then the major uh, Sunni insurgent leaders, and similarly with the Shia militia supported by Iran. In this case, you have a terrorist army. Uh, it's quite large. Uh, it is completely extremist, and it has to be destroyed. Now, again, keep in mind, destruction doesn't mean every last one of them. It means to render them incapable of accomplishing their mission without reconstitution. And so if if you agree with that, and, and I agree that this can be debated, but but given the trauma that they went through, I don't know how you couldn't default. That, that This has to be the conclusion. Look what we just went through. Can we do anything less than seek the destruction of this entity, prevent it from ever governing uh, the territory again, then obviously get the hostages back. The decision that is something you might will, will be relooked is how you go about doing that. What is the campaign design? Um, how quickly do you start the hold phase and the rebuilding? Um, can you find mechanisms to keep the hospitals open, get more humanity? You know, all these kinds of issues, I think, uh, Aaron David, these are, are ones that you can examine but now we are where we are, and I think what you have to do at this juncture uh, is going forward, take the lessons learned, and they're learning as they go, again, in a very, very the toughest imaginable context, um, to, uh, to add the components that General Zinni and I have described. Over. Well, are they learning? I mean, what's the evidence that they're learning? They're, the bombing has not diminished. Uh, well, I think it has, actually. I think there's there's considerably less use of the huge... Uh, bunker busters and these kind of munitions. Again, I think there there actually is uh, a considerable shift in that regard. We'll see when they go into Rafa, which is going to be particularly challenging, and how they're able to separate the people from from Hamas. But General, yeah, if I could add one thing to what uh, uh, General Petraeus said, and, and and first of all, uh, I'm forever in debt to Aaron. He was my my brain out there for a, a year and a half. Uh, I I think that. When we talk about the destruction of Hamas, there's another element that we should emphasize. Young people that join Hamas out of desperation or out of frustration, we have to think about ways we can wean them away. Yep. We convince mothers that your son, there's, a bet, there's another opportunity. That's not the only path toward yep. resolving your issues. So it, it's not just a matter of killing, as General Petraeus said, every single one of them. You have to give them an alternative to express their grievances, to have hope, and and to be able to uh, uh, think about a, a different kind of future. The, I've I've watched the process of how some of those groups convince young men to and and women to become uh, suicide bombers. It's an intricate, very involved process, and they go after the most vulnerable of of the teenage, uh, preteen kids. And and they 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 beat them over the head with everything that is wrong and everything that has happened, and they see it in their own families and what's happening on the ground and their father's land is being taken. They're the third son out of five. They have no future, and that is played up. 
and 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 the idea that they will be heroes if, if, if they do this. We have to have an alternative for them to get them away from that. And, and I'll go back to what I've said several times. There has to be something that shows hope at the end of this. If I could just add uh, for the those that are listening and haven't seen this great book, The Much Too Promised Land uh, by Aaron, I commend it to you. It captures the complexity, the challenges, the hopes, the frustrations, the realities just brilliantly. And congratulations uh, to you on it, Aaron. Let's go to, go to another question. We will take our next question from Jane Harmon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Aaron, you've got a lot of free publicity. I'm very <laughs> jealous. Um, I'm sure you set it up ahead of time. Um, just kidding. Uh, very good conversation. Here's my question. I, I know everyone agrees that hope is not a strategy. And I'm having a very hard time, in spite of what General Zinni keeps repeating, fitting the build piece into something Israel would ever want to do. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu, it seems to me, has spent decades um, using the, the radicalized Palestinians around him uh, as a prop to keep himself in power, and now he still faces court challenges and so forth. So I guess my question is, given current management in Israel, is there any way that uh, there would ever be an, a real open mind to the hope strategy. And if there isn't, what are the chances of perhaps uh, causing the Israelis to want to have new elections and change their government? Who wants to tackle that one? <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll, I'll take that on. I, I think that, uh, well, obviously, uh, Jane's right about uh, the current government and the current, uh, maybe even the current attitude at the time. Uh, but we have to go. We have to work past that. No one lives forever. No government's in place forever, uh, and uh, we have to uh, we have to get convince the Israeli people as well uh, to have the sense of security and confidence that uh, embarking on a path that will lead to something like this will uh, allow them to have a secure life. Uh, and and not be constantly worried that uh, they lost control of areas around uh, a very small country, uh, and and th that's a long haul too. Uh, but I think if we focus on this Israeli government, this leadership, and say this is it forever, I agree with Jane. You you've killed hope, but uh, I don't think uh, that the Israeli people will will stay with this in the longer term, especially if it doesn't lead to the kind of results that they want. I mean, right now we have, uh, uh, we're seeing the uh, internationally the rejection of everything that's going on, the UN votes, even in our own country, on our own campuses, we're seeing, unfortunately, this sort of uh, uh, anti-Israeli, anti-Semitic uh, reaction uh, that's happening. Uh, do we know that the next generation of Americans will have the same kind of uh, allegiance and uh, toward Israel that, my generation and ones before us had, uh, I don't know about that. So what's at risk here? If they aren't willing to change a government or have a government that's more willing to, uh, to engage in a process that will lead to something that gives hope. Uh, I, I'm, not a, I'm not naive enough to think that this would happen overnight, but I think it, it, what's the alternative is the question. Let's go to another question. We will take our next question from Jordan Reamer. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, the one thing we haven't discussed yet is Iran. And I'm wondering, uh, what are your thoughts if we were able to come up with a representative government, there would still be elements of unreconcilables. Uh, do you think that Iran would still be able to maintain a foothold among the Palestinian people and uh, would would that be would that be able to continue to be a pressure point on Israel? Thank you. Well, of course, it's much bigger than just Hamas in this case. I mean, Hamas is without question funded, in some cases, certainly equipped, uh, trained to a degree, uh, enabled, and in some cases, perhaps directed, although that there's no evidence whatsoever that they directed the October 7th attacks. And if, in fact, there is evidence that they were surprised uh, by the execution of them. 
Um, but it's bigger than that, of course. I mean, Iran is trying to uh, Lebanonize Iraq, which is a problem for the United States. In other words, to create an Iraq what they did in Lebanon, which is a very powerful Iranian-supported militia on the ground and the power in the parliament to prevent anything they don't like. Um, they'd like to do the same thing in Iraq. Uh, and, of course, they're also uh, funding, training, equipping, and in various degrees directing Hezbollah, uh, which has been limiting its operations against Israel to a considerable degree, considering it has 150,000 rockets and missiles and so forth it can unleash on Israel, some of which are much longer range and more precise uh, and larger warheads than in the past. But they got hammered in 2006. And I think we actually reassessed several times the extent of the damage, and they don't want that visited upon them uh, again, but still a real problem uh, that Iran, in many respects, uh, is enabling. And then, of course, you have the Houthis, um, which are have reduced traffic through the Red Sea by some 60 percent or so, um, dramatically reducing the revenue Egypt gets from the Suez Canal at a time when that economy is very fragile and they're they're desperately seeking uh, hard currency from other countries. Um, has not had a massive effect on the global economy because it has not uh, reduced supply of crude oil or natural gas. It just, those that are actually would go through the Red Sea or going around Africa, it takes an extra 10 to 14 days, the additional cost, needless to say, but is not a huge impact. But nonetheless, that freedom of navigation has got to be restored. I think the U.S. Navy will over time sufficiently degrade and disrupt and eventually defeat um, what it is the Houthis are able to do, but they're a very resilient enemy. We saw that during the, the uh, civil war uh, in Yemen, where the other side was supported by the Emiratis and the Saudis, the Houthis supported by I Iran. Um, so look, you know, the rule number one of the Middle East, I always felt there are a couple of rules. I'll bounce them off General Zinni, uh, who is a few more than a few commanders before me. But rule number one is know who your enemies are and know who your friends are. Iran is an enemy. Uh, Israel's a friend. Uh, and then number two is Las Vegas rules do not apply in the Middle East. What happens there doesn't stay there, which is why we have to stay engaged. And every time we try to reduce our forces, we're reminded, and Fareed Zakaria stole this from the other day, put it in a column that, you know, that trying to leave the Middle East is like um, the, the the Corleone family trying to leave the mafia. You know, every time you do this, Michael Corleone, you get sucked back in. Um, and I think far better that we actually that yes, we need to rebalance to Asia. Yes, the Indo-Pacific has to be the number one priority without question. But that doesn't mean that you uh, pivot away from you should maintain a certain presence that it was more clearly than I think we had at the time. By the way, just a, a footnote, the U.S. Navy is really engaged in the first real maritime uh, combat arguably since World War II. Yes, there were the tanker wars in the Gulf, but nothing like this. They're getting intercepting major missiles. There have been underwater uh, drones and so forth. There's an ace out there. A Marine pilot has actually shot down six drones. This is quite a campaign, but it has to be methodical. You have to have the intelligence architecture that enables you to identify not just when they're about to launch, but where they're being stored, what the radars are, the command and control the ship locations, all of this. And I think they're doing this quite impressively, but it's going to be a long effort. This is not the work of, of weeks or a couple of months. I think you're going to have to have an enduring uh, effort there uh, before that can be restored, the freedom of navigation to what it was prior. Over. Uh, let me just add that I don't think there's a, a, a natural connection between the Palestinians and the, right. and, right. the and the Iranians. Uh, that's a that's an arrangement of convenience. Yep. Uh, you know, Persian, Shia, Arab, Sunni. You know, uh, if you they can be weaned away from that relationship. The Houthis, I think, and I, I I'd like to get General Petraeus' reaction. Is I think we can bring the Houthis to the table, uh, and I think the Omanis might be the best source of uh, opening up a dialogue and trying to figure out. Uh, how that can be uh, quieted down. Uh, but, you know, David, David's uh, uh, is more recent than I am in terms of the dynamics out there now. 
we I had the Houthis at the table, didn't we? I mean, and but this yeah, yeah, situation yeah, has yeah, sort yeah, of absolutely. blown up the yeah. whole thing. Yeah, I look. I think that there. I think General Zinni comment earlier that weaning some of them away is a valid and would be a wise effort, at the very least, to make that effort. Uh, of course, Israel is going to have to do this, though. Again, we're not on the ground. We're not engaged. This is something they have to do as part of their campaign. So I don't say that everyone there is irreconcilable. I tend to think the leaders are, though. Uh, I think that they are much closer to the Islamic State than they are to groups that you can win them over. But it doesn't mean, again, again, you can't kill or capture your way out of an industrial strength insurgency. You have to do some degree Uh, reconciliation. So I would actually see it more the Houthis that are administering in a way, they're the bureaucrats, they're the people that know how to turn the lights back on to fix the water system, get the energy uh, going, all of these things that you need actually to run an area that you don't fully understand. um, That's, I think, where there might be an effort. And then eventually, of course, you persuade the people that life is better without the Houthis than it was with them. But I'd also underscore um, what General Zinni said, that there's not a natural affinity here. You know, the, the idea that, again, Persian Shia have a, have a friendship with Sunni Arabs, um, it, it's very different from the friendship that they have, which is much more natural with the Hezbollah, Shia militia uh, in, in Iraq, and uh, the Houthis, all of whom are obviously Shia, even if of slightly different um, uh elements, if you will, or slightly somewhat different sects, if you will. I just raised a question in my mind that that is closer to your more recent experience, uh, General Zinni, talking about the question of leverage and what incentives are for Israel. Um, You know, the administration's holding out the prospect of Saudi-Israeli relations uh, to persuade the Israeli government to, to essentially do what it wants and get on board to a two-state solution, however remote that seems with the current uh, Israeli government. But some say the Saudis are asking for too much, a a bilateral security agreement, a civil nuclear agreement, uh, major new arms sales. How do you see the prospect of regional cooperation? And can that actually be part of the solution? And is the administration too eager now to give the Saudis things that they've never would have given them in the past in order to get the Israelis to do something. Well, for the first part of your question, Karen, uh, you know, the Holy Grail out there ever since CENTCOM was created is to form a coalition Mm. that uh, uh, had a multilateral uh, uh, agreement of some sort. They like doing business bilaterally. You know, they like one one offs. Uh, uh, But I do think if if these Saudi approach would be uh, that we can bring in, let's say, the Gulf states, the GCC states, collectively, uh, and, and if certain things can be met. And if those things, from the Israeli point of view, are a little too much, let's sit down and talk about them. Let's negotiate. You know, uh, it, it, it has the potential, if the Israelis see that they can get a wider regional collective multilateral arrangement, they might be willing to to compromise on some of these or agree to some of these, but it's worth talking about. But I think doing these one off like it's with the Saudis or it's with the Emiratis or with the Bahrainis, uh, I, I think that that approach doesn't offer enough incentive uh, to get these done. You know, we used to have a term called bilateral multilateralism. Uh, <laughs> that, I'm sure General Zinni knows what you mean. They won't work with each other. But they'll work with us, and then we could integrate what it is they were working with us. So integrated air defense system, which is one of the elements of the Holy Grail. Mm-hmm. Can't you all just share threat information, early warning, radar, uh, and, and so forth? And there wasn't the level of trust to do that. So they would do it with us, and then we would do it, and we would integrate it all together. We have to sort of do that again here, I think. That's how it will start out. Um, noting that some of these countries are, are you know, a good bit more um, really influential and, and have progressed very substantially from even just, say, you know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago. I think we have time for one or two more questions from the members. We will take our next question from Elise Labatt. 
<clears throat> Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes. Oh, thank you, um, General Petraeus and General Zinni. Elise Labbitt with American University. Um, I would just love to fo um, follow up on, on what um, General Zinni was saying about the government and the public attitude. It definitely seems as if right now, and maybe not in any time soon, it's not just the government, but the Israeli public that isn't ready for kind of the future that we're discussing today um, for safety reasons or just from the trauma for October 7th. So I'm I'm just wondering, you know, how we move past, you know, this trauma to get back to the idea that a majority of Israelis do want a two state solution because the country has moved so far to the right. I'm wondering if it's not just an issue of of governments, but an issue of public attitude that politicians will continue to um, try to bend to. Thank you, uh, Elise. I would say uh, that, that that's a great point because you probably have to start out talking about security and guarantee security guarantees first. Uh, when I went out there, it was right after nine eleven. Uh, the uh, second intifada was going on, uh, and, and Secretary Powell told me, let's try to do this one piece at a time and start with security, because that on both sides will have uh, the most immediate impact. And then from security, you could move into some of the other issues. You could even do it at the same time, but prioritize security initially, because to your point, it it's what you need to build confidence uh, to proceed on and 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 some sort of confidence uh, that uh, we've created a, a security umbrella that allows us to move to the next steps. I was going to say the exact same thing. I think that's exactly right. When you've experienced something as traumatic as this, it's all about security. And again, keep in mind that that's not just about um, Hamas and Gaza. It's also Hezbollah has to be resolved. It is also... Uh, again, issues in the West Bank. Um, there's also at least no question that sentiment in Israel has shifted from a, a good majority that was in favor of a two state for two uh, two peoples um, to either even or even less support uh, and, and uh, general opposition to it. Uh, just again, a very close call, but that is very, very significant. And so there's going to then have to be a real campaign, uh, again, to point out that in in the absence of an alternative, uh, none of which has been offered that is really viable, and General Zinni laid out the challenges of demographics, um, that they're going to have to get back to this. But security is the first step. Um, remember in, in Vietnam, John Paul Van said, uh, security may be the first 10% of the first 90% uh, but it is the first. Um, it may be 10% of the solution or 90%, but it's the first 10 or 90%. So again, that's the situation here. And that has to be uh, the focus clearly, but there should be a vision for the future. And the sooner that can be provided, that gives hope uh, to the Palestinians, as well as security to the Israelis, uh, the better, because you need that vision out there to guide what you do in the short and medium term. I'm afraid we have to stop there, although I know a lot of people have a lot more questions, as as do I. This has been terrific. Thank you all for joining uh, today's virtual meeting, and thank you to General Zinni, General Petraeus.